Hi, everybody, and welcome to Different Leaf, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. This episode, we're going to talk to one of medical marijuana's highest profile supporters. If you have the summer issue of Different Leaf the magazine, the one on cannabis and travel, flip to page 60 and you'll see today's guest. Legendary talk show host, Navy veteran, and decades-long medical cannabis advocate, Montel Williams. If you don't have your copy yet, go to differentleaf.com and order the summer issue or any of the back issues, or you can find your nearest in-person retailer that sells Different Leaf the magazine. That's differentleaf.com. Today, Montel is going to take us on a deeper dive into his experience with cannabis as a medical patient with multiple sclerosis and a stroke survivor, as a decorated retired naval officer and an advocate for veterans' access to medical marijuana, and as a celebrity who moved away from opioids and came out of the cannabis closet in the early 2000s, all while he was being nominated for Emmys for the Montel Williams show, and very few others in the public eye would dare to have been so brave. Now, Montel hosts a show called Military Makeover Operation Career on Lifetime. He's always working with his nonprofit called MS Foundation, which he founded after he was diagnosed in 1999. And most recently, he's partnered with one of my personal favorite Massachusetts based companies, Freshly Baked, to produce a customized line of vape oils called Inspire by Montel. We'll be back after this quick break to chat more with Montel Williams. Well, Mr. Williams, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's talk about when your relationship with cannabis first started. I started my relationship with cannabis probably 50 years ago as, as a young person, as a child. And then I got out of it, stopped using cannabis when I entered the military. And then I circled back to cannabis around 1990. 1990. 1990. Was that straight after you'd gotten out of the military? I'd been out of the military for about three years by then. About two years, I was in the reserves. What brought you back to cannabis at that time? I think, you know, like a lot of people who don't even understand that they are probably more motivated for medical reason than others. Several things that were going on in my life had not been diagnosed with MS yet, but recognized there were some things that were going on with me. And alcohol was not something that I was really pursuing, though I had some issues with alcohol. So I started just dabbling in cannabis lightly. How often is lightly? Probably once a month, once every couple of weeks. And then when I got my diagnosis with MS, I really turned to cannabis completely. So let's talk about the use that you had during the early 2000s when you were first diagnosed with MS. MS obviously comes with a lot of pain and physical issues, but there's also a high level of depression that comes with MS diagnoses. What did you find was available to you when you first started seeking out medical marijuana? And what was the kind of guidance that you were getting? Well, back then, doctors really, let's make sure you put this in the right perspective. In the early 2000s, there was really, other than the federal government in the United States, they were the only people who really understood the medical efficacy of cannabis and have understood the medical efficacy of cannabis ever since 1998 when they first submitted their application for a patent on CBD. Long before CBD and all of the minor cannabinoids became vogue in the last four or five years, the United States government filed a patent on CBD in 1998 and granted themselves a patent in 2002. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Absolutely. It's patent number 6630507, I believe. Wow. Back when I was first diagnosed with MS, which was really 2000, I saw doctors in 99 that had a second opinion in 2000. And the original course of action for MS back then was, uh, and for any pain issues, was opioids. And mm. long before the opioid pandemic hit the world the way it has in recent years. We had an opioid pandemic back then, but nobody was willing to admit it. So yeah. doctors, their first course of action was anything pain related was an opioid. I went down that path initially until I started really overdosing on opioids and taking a little bit too much. And I had a doctor friend of mine who said, I'm done with you. I'm not going to write any more prescriptions for you for opioids. And I'm going to reach out to the doctors that I know you've been getting to write your prescriptions for you. This was in 2000. And he said, but I heard that you might be able to find some relief using marijuana. And I don't know what kind of marijuana it is, but there's some kinds of marijuana that seem to work better for people who have neuropathic illnesses and, and neurodegenerative diseases. So you want to check it out. So I started digging in deeply back in 2000, doing some research and 
stumbled upon the fact that the U.S. government had already filed for a patent and clearly recognized through about 20 years worth of research that neuropathy and from an anti-inflammatory standpoint and anti-ischemic standpoint, the cannabis did work. And they actually had identified CBD back then. And so I started looking for CBD laden plants in the year 2000, 2001. Where do you even start then? There was no internet. <laughs> How do you connect with anybody? Oh, you connect, I connected by visiting back then. We had a burgeoning medical marijuana program in California. Mm. I started running around in Northern California trying to find anybody who understood the minor cannabinoids. And it was difficult because there really wasn't a lot of discussion about that. And what a lot of people don't know is that the United States was very much involved in, so was Canada, very much involved in trying to grow the minor cannabinoids out of the plant. Mm. You don't know that uh, during the oh, 80s and 90s, breeders were trying their best to reduce all the minor cannabinoids and trying to raise the level of THC. Yeah. Um, the same way that we're stupidly trying to do that these days. I was able to stumble upon, back in 2001, a grower in Northern California who had a very peculiar strain for themselves back then that was pretty high in CBD. It was around 21, no, more like around 17% CBD, and they were really getting rid of it. They didn't want it. So I was able to stumble upon a person who said, so I'll give you all the key for this that you want. Nice. That's gold. <laughs> yeah, it was gold. I basically started using Keef. I switched over from flower to Keef back in maybe 2002 mm. and higher CBD laden plants. And I found some more that were, you know, between 12, 15% CBD and started being able to figure out how to make a blend myself that seemed to help me with my issues. So you were doing this at home and just sort of figuring it out figuring by yourself. It. Was anybody giving you any advice or guidance nope. on how to ingest it? Nope. It was just like you try it, you feel it, you figure it out yourself. You should try to do themselves right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that yeah. there's a lot of fake advice out there. And I think the thing that we do understand when it comes to cannabis is that everybody is an island into themselves. Everybody's endocannabinoid system functions differently. And the way cannabis affects every individual is individual. And so I took a journey on my own trying to figure this thing out and was able to navigate burgeoning breakthrough states while I was also out around the country advocating for cannabis as a medicine as early as 2002. I was able to literally figure it out for myself and come up with a blend that literally gave me relief. I mean, it's amazing for the time because of the situation legally, but I think that it's also just something that humans sort of have naturally in them, some sort of symbiosis with plant medicine. Well, I mean, we do know for a fact that human beings and all mammals on the planet, all mammals on the planet have an endocannabinoid system. That was discovered, I mean, what was so ridiculous about this is that, you know, you go to lectures now or you go to meetings now, people act as if there's some sort of phenomenally recent information. This has been available since the mid nineties. I mean, 19, 1988, I think 86 is when Dr. Mishulam first discovered the endocannabinoid system. So this is nothing new. This is something that's been validated by science and has been looked at by science and been studied by science. And we recognize that the endocannabinoid system is responsible for our cellular homeostasis. Now, does that work the same way with all plant-based medicines? I'm sure that since we found a system that does work for cannabis, I will guarantee you there's got to be systems inside our body that work for other plant-based medicines also. Yeah. You know, I think if we believe in who we consider one of the smartest people on the planet in the last century, Albert Einstein, he said for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So therefore, for every disease on this planet, there was probably a cure here. We've just been so stupid that we tried to destroy them all rather than preserve them all. Mm. That's a really great point that, you know, we should be in some sort of harmony with our nature, but it seems that we've gotten away with that, especially in the last hundred years, we've really moved away from it. Back in 2003, you know, you started using Keef and you were moving on to extractions to try and help yourself out. And I saw an interview that you did where you said that the only way to be on camera and not drooling on opioids was to turn to this cannabinoid medication. Was there anybody at the time that you could tell? Could you tell your producers? Because you were still nope. in the air. Nope, I couldn't. Until I actually I ran into some issues, I think it was in 2004, it might have been 2003, where I got stopped in an airport in Detroit traveling across the country and then literally made a poster child for cannabis. I, until then, I really hadn't discussed it much with anyone. 
But then the second that I came forward, everybody was seemed more than interested. And I started advocating. I started, I just jumped out in the public eye. I didn't really care what people thought. From my perspective, it was all about me feeling better. And I didn't give a damn about anything, any thoughts of anybody else trying to stop me from feeling better. So, yeah. you know, I became a very, very vocal advocate, testified before legislators all over, legislations all over the country, speaking out about making this medicine available to others. So you were profiled, I'll say, as one of the first celebrities to come out, you know, in support of medical marijuana. I, I think you know, there had been a few people who had already talked about just the fact that they were using it. They weren't talking about it from a medical standpoint. But I think I was probably one of the higher profile first to come out and say, yes, I use cannabis. I use it every day and I don't give a damn what you think about it. <laughs> I remember it, actually. <laughs> I remember you being one of the first. And I didn't know at the time sort of what medical marijuana was. I was like in my late teens. But I knew who you were and I knew that I trusted you and that you had candid conversations. And whenever I could skive my way off school and be homesick, <laughs> yours was one of the shows that I would watch. It was one of the many shows that came over from America. That was sort of your brand, you know, like this is just a very honest conversation. And so it made sense to me when you came out and were one of the first people to say, this really helps me in some way. And I thought that makes sense that he's, Montel Williams is one of the first to disclose that. I wonder now how many others there are that haven't been as brave as him yet to disclose it. And even till the day, as many steps as we've taken forward today, there are still too many people, foreign celebrities and politicians and law enforcement and doctors and nurses and you name it, who are all users who basically are hiding in the closet, afraid to step forward and talk about truth. I mean, we have medical schools in this country that won't even teach the endocannabinoid system. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's kind of crazy. And it's crazy. I mean, this isn't, this isn't something that is fake science, but, you know, we as a world have started to have less belief in science, even though science is the truth that will set us all free. But, you know, we've had some politicians that have stepped up and made it seem to be crazy to believe in science and, you know, push back for things like climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it, you know, is really where the genesis of some of this began. So if I can say that there's no climate change, and I can say that the world is flat, we'll stop. <laughs> right. So you did mention that you'd become a well-renowned advocate back in the day. In at least 21 states, you helped to pass some legislation for medical marijuana. At Different Leaf, we like to talk about, you know, all the different communities that have become involved in the cannabis industry and in the cannabis world in general. As a black man back in the day, how did you approach the activism that you were set on? Were you afraid at all? Were you worried about any of the stigma? I had to keep riding dirty, you know what I mean? The, the whole term, you know, I had to make sure I checked myself before I went to the airport and went to places and because I knew that a sore thumb, I, I would kind of stick out and give some an excuse to want to try to go at me. And so I had to be very cautious, but at the same time, I was very careful about what I said, what I was using, when I was using it, how I was using it. So I just said I was using it. And somebody asked me, where do you get it? I didn't answer the question. It's none of your business. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. None of your business. Safest way to be. Right? And, and I had to, because I knew that there was, you know, a target on my back in some ways. But at the same time, that same target on my back gave me a little bit more license. You know, I had police officers come up to me and say, look, did I, I you know, I'm not going to, I don't even really know that I ever asked you this, but my mother suffered from cancer. Would you think that this stuff would help? I've had politicians come over to me and say, look, I'm not going to say I said this to you, but I've got somebody working in my office right now that I allow to come into the office and use it all the time. There's some of the top politicians in this country who were hiding because they're afraid. It's the same thing that's going on now. I mean, you know, at a lot of these more conservative parties, somebody out back is smoking a joint. And you know that. Yeah. And yet they're afraid to step up into the light and say that I've done something. So until we get people who are more apt to not fear other people's opinions, I think we're going to be stuck in the same place. But what's happened, and I think, is that you, you, you pointed out something very clearly. You guys like to talk about what's happening globally. I think it's like almost, what, 50 plus countries now have broken away from the UN treaty that was signed back, I think, in 1963 that prohibited, you know, distribution of, of hemp or cannabis around the world. And all over the world now, countries are stepping up to the plate and saying, you know what, this has been something perpetrated against us, that evil empire of the United States, and we're going to turn our backs on them, and I'm glad they are. Yeah, me too. And like you said, there's, there's so much stigma around folks accessing it, and that includes veterans, which is something that you've really put at the forefront of your advocacy. 
is trying to get as many veterans as you can knowledge and access to this plan. I'm speaking um, this week in, in Hawaii, and a, one of the oldest veteran support organizations in the United States called AMBETS. I'm speaking, I'm the keynote speaker at their convention this week in Hawaii. We fly out on Friday to get there, and I'll be speaking on the issue of giving safe access to our soldiers. We know that this works. I mean, you know, there, there, there's, there's so many things. One of the things that, that came out of COVID in the last couple of years is that well, we was hunkered down. We thought that research had stopped, but research had not stopped. Mm-hmm. And researchers all over the world have now started to open their eyes to the efficaciousness of this plant. All of the minor cannabinoids that once you put it together the right way, I mean, there's research out of Australia that shows that some of the minor cannabinoids have impact on the most virulent form of cancer on the planet, pancreatic yeah. cancer. There is research that has already been proven, you know, minor cannabinoids affect the spike protein on the outer shell of the COVID vac- virus. So cannabis has an effect on COVID, yet we are so ignorant that we won't accept science. Yeah. Uh, this is actually why I got interested in cannabis to begin with. My mother had cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, while I was studying in California. And being so far away from her in England, I just wanted to know something, you know, I just, I wanted to feel like I had some sort of grasp of what was going on with her. So I studied cannabis and I took just like a one credit course on the biology of cancer. And I grilled (laughs) my professors basically to get everything I could out of them to understand, because I knew that there was some sort of link there and I heard almost rumors about it. And I wanted to know if I could send my mother to buy some street weed, literally smoke her way out of this issue. And that was back in 2015, 2016. And in the years since, like there's been just so much research. I can't look away. The medical cannabis movement has been absolutely why I got involved with it. And actually speaking of veterans that face stigma to try and access cannabis, One of the reasons that I got my first cannabis card, my medical marijuana card when I was living in California, was because my then boyfriend, now husband, was serving in the U.S. Marine Corps. He was stationed at Camp Pendleton in Southern California. And when he was discharged, he was, after two tours of Afghanistan, he was very concerned that he was going to lose his VA benefits if he started to seek out medical marijuana cards. So I told him that I would get a medical marijuana card, even as an immigrant. I thought that that's going to be less detrimental to us, less of a threat to us if I get the card. He was so worried that he would lose his VA benefits. I'm just so glad that we've come so far since then. Now veterans know that they can access it. Yeah, as long as they live in a state that has a legal medical program, the VA will not even ask questions about it, honestly. But I think that's not enough. I mean, what we have to do is now start to make the product available and allow doctors in the VA to talk about it. You know, they're still not even allowed to discuss it. They can't go into detail. They can't give you information about it. And there's so many veterans that could use a little, not nudge, but use the information to help better their lives. I I do a show right now that's called Military Makeover, where we literally take the homes of deserving veterans and we we make them from the ground up and we do everything from floors to ceilings, the bathrooms, the bedrooms, walls, paint the house, the outside, everything. But when we get done, you know, I've left these guys what would be a forever home, but have not really left them with a forever life. And a lot of the veterans that we help are still suffering. These guys are suffering from PTSD. And I'm not a doctor, so I can't step in the middle of them and say, look, I'm telling you, I really think that you should just see how cannabis could help you. Because I for fear that I don't want them to get in trouble. And some of the states that we do the makeovers in are not legal states yet for cannabis. But I really wish that they had an opportunity to be able to go to the hospital and sit down and talk to a doctor or a counselor who wasn't going to just say, oh, no, you can't do that. That's so bad for you. Instead, we'd talk to them with an the open mind about the fact that, you know, we know for a fact that cannabis helps to excite the endogenous endocannabinoid system, which is what keeps our cells in homeostasis, period. Mm-hmm. We know this. There's not, this isn't, isn't something I'm making up. This is something that's printed and, and peer reviewed, studied all over the world. And so doctors need to stop, get a grip, and start telling them the truth. Have you seen anything over the years changing in the way the veteran community is opening up to the idea of cannabis? Well, I know that since the VA has decided to almost assume a posture of don't ask, don't tell, you know, I know that there are more veterans who are at least accessing. But that's not good enough. And there are those who still 
give you that wink, wink, oh, that really doesn't work kind of a thing that need to be smacked upside their head and sent back to medical school so that they understand that if I can teach you something about drug like thalidomide or, you know, if you remember one of the worst drugs that ever hit the scene in the world was a drug that was used in the late 50s, early 60s for issues during pregnancy and ended up causing some of the worst birth defects of any drug that we've ever put in the marketplace. And now, 30, 40 years later, the drug that had been banned has now found a, a new life in the world because after studying it, they recognize that it has some efficacy for other maladies. And so now they're sort of using it. Well, if science can let you do that, if science can teach you that chemotherapy, the way we deliver it today is good, then science should be able to teach you that the endocannabinoid system and the cannabinoids in their natural state, we know have an effect on our endogenous endocannabinoid system, which is how, why we are capable of healing ourselves from various illnesses that we have. So let's talk about the products that you've most recently brought to the Massachusetts market with one of our favorite companies out here, Freshly Baked Company. Well, absolutely. Freshly Baked, yes. Yeah, we've had Philip Smith on the show as well to chat about when they were first starting up. And now they've really grown and they're carrying your vapes, Inspire. Yes. They are my contract manufacturers. As a matter of fact, I had Phil on my show and I do a show that's called Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Or Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And you can find it at letsbebluntmontel.com. I had Phil on and then after we talked, then he was just on as a guest. But I recognized that synergistically we had the same feelings and the same beliefs. And I said, you know, dude, let's talk a little bit about possibly, you know, I had had my product line out on the West Coast and I was looking for a way to distribute on the East Coast, knowing that every individual state, which is something that's ridiculous, every state you end up having to have a separate manufacturer in that state for the product that's being used in that state, which is so stupid. But knowing that we had to do that, I said to Phil, I'd love to be able to maybe see if I can give you my formulations and you take a look at them and if you believe in them then let's partner up and maybe I can release mine. Do you have a vape? And he said they didn't have a vape at that point in time. So he looked at the formulations. And these are formulations that I have done myself. I'm my own formulator. And I looked at him and said, wow, this is really kind of crazy. They were able to manufacture them to the T perfectly. So we launched Inspired by Montel in Massachusetts. And we right now have three SKUs out and we're about to keep creating more and more SKUs of different products that we're going to have in the marketplace uh, in mass. And hopefully we'll move that to Illinois, to Michigan, to Pennsylvania, to New Jersey. We're going to move it around the country, hopefully. Nice. When you say that these are your formulations, you've got one that's like a 95% THC and a 5% CBD, and then you've got a 50-50%. And then the third one is, is flipped. It's you know, heavy on the CBD and yes. just 10% of the THC. Yes. Are there different efficacies for you? Do you use these for different things at different times of day? Not only are they formulated with different amounts of THC, CBD by volume, but they also have proprietary terpene formulations that have been added to each one of those SKUs. And then I do those for a particular reason because they are for energy, they're for calmness, and they're for relaxing. And each one of them, because of the way I think they're formulated, the consensus has been from those who have used them that they actually elicit the response that we have on the box. Mm, that's nice to hear. Yeah, but absolutely. And I've been working, you know, I've been working with formulating and for now close to 20 years. I mean, I've formulated for myself. And these are the products that I use myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited about the fact that we're able to now offer them up and in Massachusetts, and we are going to expand. That's exciting. And I read in, in our article about you in Different Leaf magazine that these are going to be able to be vaped, smoked, and dabbed. Is that right? Oh, you can right now, if you buy our vape pen, you can literally open up the cartridge and, you know, take a drop of it out of there. You can dab it. You can eat it. Huh. You smoke it. You can drip it onto, you know, flour. Smoke it. Or you can just consume it straight out of the vape pen. I hopefully within the next six months or so, we will have the oils available so that you can then put it in whatever you want to put it in. Right now, we have them in vape cards, but I'm also working very hard. Right now, we're working to manufacture a pre-roll in the same vein. Pre-rolls will be a formulation. They will be some hemp 
leaf flower. There will mm. be some cannabis leaf flower. And then I'm going to augment that with, you know, a little additional terpene. We could do that by either lightly spraying on some oil of those terpenes and so that we can induce the same kind of effect when you smoke it as a cool. And I'm also going to, we've got a couple of, I think we have some pretty proprietary products that we're going to be coming out with. Hopefully that'll, I think, redefine the way people, I mean, this should be all about not the manufacturer making a product and forcing you to use it, but me manufacturing a product that makes it easier for the consumer to consume. Mm -hmm. And so we're manufacturing products. We're working on a couple of lines right now that I think are going to redefine the way consumers consume. Well, I love to rely on a veteran cannabis smoker and an actual veteran <laughs> for your knowledge. Yeah, I'm absolutely going to be trying these vapes. I'm going to head on down sometime this weekend and hit myself one of those 50-50s and, and yeah, the, the, week the, the 50 50 you know, hey, what's the old saying? And there's a saying that, that works for this product completely, you know, slow as you go. Yeah. You know? And I've made them so that you have to, I want you to go slow. I mean, just titrate slowly, take a couple of little inhalations, sit on it for a minute. If it hasn't hit the level of euphoria you want, take a couple more. Sit on it for a minute. That hasn't right. gotten you there. Then you might want to go ahead and jump up to the energy. The uh, The big banger that we have, which is the 95.5, is really just an incredible product, I think. I use that quite a bit. But I also have been savoring my 50-50 myself personally quite a bit. Because, you know, when I want to go a little bit further into euphoria land and enjoy that television show I'm watching or that movie I'm watching, you know, I can hit that a couple extra times and get me right where I want to be. Whereas if I were to start off with the 95.5, I'm hit that twice and I might just stop right there because, you know, yeah. you, keep, you keep pressing it. It's going to give you back what you asked for. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. Careful what you ask for because that's, you know, we all know, you know, once it's in you, it ain't coming out. <laughs> yeah. Go come. slow. That's right. So slow. Go slow. Go slow. <laughs> Good advice. Well, thank you, Montel, for joining us today for yet another candid conversation. Thank you. And uh, very, very uh, excited to try your new products in Massachusetts. Thank you so much. And, and, you know, hopefully at the same time I'm working on that project, the Mass, I'm also working on getting my CBD formulations back out in the marketplace around the country. I have a contract manufacturer in New Jersey that I've been working with. And we're about a month away from getting skewed, getting them up and ready to be shipped. And we can ship those all over the country. So that will be coming your way very soon, too. Awesome. All right, guys. Eyes out for Montel CBD as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Britt. Thanks for having me. A massive thanks to our guest today, Montel Williams. If you're listening to this before the end of August 2022, you can still catch Montel touring and speaking at a few Massachusetts dispensaries before the end of summer. You can find out more at inspiremontel.com. Next week, we're talking to cannabis travel agency experts April and Bobby Black and Brian Applegarth about the newest 420 travel trends. The travel and tourism development is happening in the Coachella Valley or the greater Palm Springs kind of region, which is out near the desert, about an hour and a half from LA. There's a cannabis lounge. When you walk in, you've got a stage, you've got pool tables, you've got stand up chess. You can sit on any of these different lounge areas and consume it and watch the stage, whoever's performing. They have burlesque up there certain nights. They have songwriter nights up there. They have an arcade that you can cruise into and play video games. They have a whole room full of bongs and glass. And then in the evenings, they have three different bars. They have a beverage bar for cannabis, a dab bar, and then a flower bar. This is California cannabis today. It's wild. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you're listening right now and follow us on social media at Different Leaf and at Different underscore Leaf. And I'm at Brit the British. Check out differentleaf.com where you can purchase all the issues of Different Leaf the magazine, including the new summer issue all about cannabis travel and tourism. That's differentleaf.com. Different